My name is Bill Wright. Uh, I work as the chair and I work for everybody in the enterprise neurosystem. Uh, I think this is a really exciting day to be able to present this vision. And I think the, uh, the direction of the community because of the momentum that's taken place over the last few months, it, it's the perfect time to go over everything. <clears throat> and I have to forg please forgive me, I have a little bit of a cold I'm navigating. So if I have a deep gravelly voice, I guess that'll add to the effect. So uh, I just want to welcome you all and thank you for being here. And one of the most gratifying things I've had in my career is to work with a group of people that really comprise this community. It's been really exciting to build this from the ground up. And I want to give you a bit of the history and context of the community, basically the trajectory of it over the last uh, four years, and also talk a little bit about where we are now and what's, uh, what's in the future, which is actually quite exciting. So let me go ahead and share my deck. And can you all see this? Yep, this is good. We can see it. Okay, I'll go into slideshow mode. Is that better? You can see the slideshow. Hmm. <clears throat> Excellent. So the enterprise neurosystem began in a very interesting way. And uh, in, in my career, uh, I have always found that having conversations with my customers, who are basically my friends as well, um, to be honest with you, um, is always the way forward in terms of coming up with new innovations. And I was sitting at a lunch in Mexico City with uh, Raul Reyes, who was one of the directors in charge of global infrastructure for America Mobile. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things about that meeting was uh, he, we were having a great conversation over lunch at this wonderful restaurant called Loma Linda. And we were going back and forth and he said, well, Bill, what is Red Hat doing in the area of artificial intelligence right now? And again, you have to remember, this is about six years ago. And at the time, AI was, uh, was nowhere near uh, experiencing the market momentum that you see today. It, it was really in the nascent early stages. And so I said, I kind of laughed. I said, well, we're, we're supporting it as a workload, but we're not doing much else than that. And at the time we hadn't uh, as a company. And I just wanted to be honest about it. And he just kind of smiled and he said, you know, what's interesting is your company has a very unique leadership position from an open source perspective to really present a neutral viewpoint on how this, uh, this movement should be formed. And he said, I think you ought to go out and do something. And he didn't specify what it was, but he said, as Red Hat, you should go out there and really get something started. And Red Hat has always taken a very neutral approach to community development. Um, never really imposing its will per se. It's, it's a really nice company from that perspective. And so it's always been kind of a Switzerland in open source in many respects. Uh, and so I went ahead and I started this community, the Enterprise Neurosystem. And we started out originally with a focus group internally at Red Hat talking about AI and mobile networks and what that could look like. Uh, Narendra Narang and Sanjay Ayagari and uh, Chris Wright, our CTO, a number of other folks, uh, Azar Saeed, all joined those early calls. And it was really interesting because it was really um, kind of set the stage for the, I guess you could say the scientific or the uh, creative pursuit that this community has really embodied, which we were just throwing ideas against the wall and talking about where the future could go. <clears throat> and so we, we started talking more and more about biosystems and how mobile networks really resembled a neurology and how AI was really kind of the last mile in that construct, because if you look at it, and it's I, uh, long story short, I took a uh, physiology class at UC Berkeley, a, a night school class. Uh, I was going to another college over the hill, St. Mary's College and playing rugby there. And I was uh, frequently getting uh, concussions <laughs> playing rugby. It's a little bit of a uh, off kilter story, but what was funny about it is it made me very curious about human anatomy and the effects that I was experiencing from a, from a concussion made me want to go out and take a physiology class. So I signed up at UC Berkeley and started to look at this, the human body as a complete system. It was really fascinating. And so that, uh, just that basic experience and other experiences began to kind of form the direction of the community as we began to get it started. And what we realized was uh, climate change was becoming a very real issue. And there's no better way to start a community than to focus on a real public good. That was the idea. And around the time frame that the community gets started um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, there were quite a few wildfires that were taking place. <clears throat> and some of you probably saw those pictures that were coming out over cell phones of the skies of San Francisco 
during one of the, the big wildfires in the area. And the skies, it was fascinating. The, the mobile phone filters, the camera filters were on. And so the skies looked quite deep orange. But if you were here in person and you looked out the window, the sky was like a fire engine red. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. And I was looking out the window with my son. And, and again, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom, but it was really dramatic. You could not help but notice the entire horizon was deep red. And my son just looked at me and he was like, what is going on, dad? And uh, I decided, you know, hey, this is the area of focus we should take as a community. And what is interesting is in the climate space, it's very similar to the enterprise space in terms of the different projects and the different AI models and kind of the state of the enterprise at that time. And what I what we all realized and what we all discussed was, you know, a lot of big multinational corporations had run out and hired data scientists in an effort to get started with creating models and software applications to start analyzing every aspect of their business. And it was really like software development back in the 70s and the 80s, if you look back in history, because a lot of these big companies would begin to basically build their own software applications and then try to manage them and maintain them themselves. It was a very similar movement in many ways. You can really see these patterns as if you're as old as I am <laughs> over time and you look back and you can kind of see the same patterns evolving and, and beginning again. Well, the same things happening in the enterprise were happening in the climate space. You have all these different uh, projects like NOAA and the European Space Agency and, and go down the list uh, from a satellite perspective. And then you have all the oceanic and atmospheric, atmospheric projects that are all in different parts of the world and different countries are organizing. And then you have an area that's completely missed as well, which are nature-based sensors. And humanity for some psychological reason is much better at observing nature and standing back and staying outside of it but we're not actually in nature trying to understand the effects we're having on these different communities and ecosystems and species around the world. And so in these discussions, in the evolution of the community, one of the things that began to emerge was on top of these other areas of integration that we could pull together in one giant AI overlay network, there are also nature-based sensors that need to be implemented as well. And it's not to cover the earth and sensors, that's not the idea, but in specific regions, just for points of information, you could create an additional layer that would basically directly engage with the species of nature and unobtrusively gather data on their health, on their migrations, and what's really taking place in real time. And the idea with all of this is to create one large scale AI overlay network that would then integrate all these different points of information and then begin to basically provide a dashboard of the, of the world's health. I mean, that's the interesting thing. None of these projects have been fully integrated and the results cross correlated at depth to this date. And that's what is really truly missing in terms of the global climate picture right now. And one of the nice things about this kind of an approach is it becomes an early warning architecture. You begin to see patterns well in advance, given all the cross correlation that take that can take place. And it really begins to inform you in terms of what kinds of actions you can take to apply as a course correction. And that's really the idea is to try to get ahead of some of these events and really take corrective action to balance the state of this uh, situation. So to go over it real quickly, uh, I think everybody on this call knows, but uh, we have a variety of different AI engineers and scientists, infrastructure experts, telecommunications experts, roughly 180 volunteers. I'd say it's close to 30 to 50 kind of power users, folks that show up to the different working groups and the main meetings, and then another 100 plus that we can reach out to at any given time to basically help as needed. So it's really been a nice community from that perspective and an all volunteer organization in terms of getting the, uh, the mission accomplished. Again, the objective is to build a global AI neurosystem for climate change, again, based on these principles of uh, neurology or physiology. It's interesting. We're really trying to borrow from nature as much as we are from the IT domain to really understand what this architecture should look like. And then it's really an open source AI, op AI software and infrastructure construct that we're trying to enable. And so, all the different sensor networks, all these different aspects, we're trying to use as much open source as possible to make it more accessible. And also from a upgrade and a development perspective to make that environment more dynamic. That's something that can really take place quickly as needed. 
And then also educational partnerships, working with different government organizations. And I think one of the most exciting things for us has been our work uh, with AIM for Climate and the UNFCCC. Uh, the UNF CCC, the TEC, which is the Technical Executive Committee, and the CTCN, which is the project arm of the UNFCCC, both of those organizations have engaged us, and it's been really exciting to see the development and some of the initiatives take place there. But in terms of AIM for Climate, we drove a grand challenge there, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, this represents uh, the organizations where our volunteers work. Uh, not all of this is officially sanctioned, but I think what's great is this shows you the kinds of diversity we have in our talent pool and the kinds of people that are involved. Uh, they come from all these different areas, and all these different areas are actually quite uh, quite relevant. Uh, the University of Pittsburgh Medical School, uh, Abhinil Bhuman there, uh, who works in neurosciences research, uh, has been studying brainwave patterns for quite a long time now and has inadvertently, because of his work in a epilepsy and epileptic seizures, begin to see the patterns of communication within the human brain in real time. And so we're trying to work with him on occasion to basically take some of that thinking and some of those processes back. And we've seen already some parallels in terms of internet communications and the research that he's done. And then also, if you take a look at a Stanford Slack, uh, Ryan Coffey, one of our uh, one of our board members and a longtime supporter uh, has been instrumental in some of our experimentation and the different things we've been achieving. Uh, I could go down the list and I just can't overlook IBM research because IBM research I approached in the very earliest days. Uh, I reached out to Dario Gill uh, out of the blue when IBM acquired Red Hat and I was like, wow, this is great. Let's get engaged. And uh, he referred me to a couple different folks, and I ended up on the doorstep of uh, Dinesh Verma, who has been a tremendous supporter and the, uh, the CTO of our organization ever since. And what's been exciting about that is IBM Research really believes in open source and this kind of open development approach. And that's been one of the most uh, kind of refreshing things. And, you know, I think in terms of the assistance we've received from them, it's always been just like open and free and engaging. And I, I just can't thank them enough for all the help they've provided us with. And then of course there's Cove, which is a, uh, a brilliant memory management software technology and John Overton, who's been a diligent supporter of our efforts. And uh, I, I could just go down the list. There's so many people here that I owe so much to and uh, just can't thank them enough. So in terms of the actual approach that our organization is taking, we have Aim for Climate at the top, the United Nations, the UNFCCC, uh, and the U.S. State Department. And we're doing policy and political engagement, not to drive policy or have a policy say in things, but rather provide support and consulting when they have questions about AI and, and the kinds of technical uh, capabilities that AI can provide them in the various climate projects that they try to get started. But also down below, if you take a look, we are looking to build these AI, AI applications and build these sensors and get them into the field and to look at what this large scale cross correlation framework could be. So it leads inevitably to that global AI infrastructure for climate. So again, getting back to my point about helping nature directly, uh, you'll see at the bottom, these are the kinds of um, personnel that have been attracted to the community and that we've actually gone out and recruited. Uh, we have academics, we have sensor experts, we have data scientists, and we have network and IT engineers, and primarily from the mobile network domain, because that will be the backbone of these communications as we get going. A lot of the, way we have, a lot of the ways we have to look at this architecture is to use what already exists, to look at the satellite projects, that are already out there that we can take information from and cross correlate. But also from a backbone perspective, there are 5G mobile networks all over the world. And we can use that as the, I guess you could say the methodology to transmit the data or one of the methodologies to transmit the data and to actually uh, take the data back to the various uh, data centers that will conduct that cross correlation and feed those results back. So getting back to the sensor networks in nature, um, beehives we find are natural uh, intersections of climate data and can act as environmental sensors. This was an idea from Dennis O'Connell, uh, who was a, a senior director of uh, performance engineering at Yahoo for many, many years and is now a consultant. And really it allows you to do some interesting things. Our bee sensor currently has an AI acoustics, uh, or rather a microphone that goes all the way up into the ultrasonic domain that can capture different acoustics data, but can also capture different gases. Like, uh, you know, I think about it, you could, you can get methane, you can get nitrogen, et cetera. 
And it's really by design because we want to do the pure research of listening to the acoustics of the bees themselves and understanding what those patterns might be through AI analysis. <clears throat> and again, we're using a software donation from IBM Research to enable this, which has been wonderful. And if you think about it, we're going to do that pure research from that perspective to enable it, but provide a direct return on value and investment with the, uh, with the methane data and the other data that we can gather as part of that sensor package. And so there's really a research element, a pure research element, and then also a practical element where we're giving data back that the world needs immediately. But uh, there are a lot of different ways that bee populations can capture different pollutants and different elements from the environment around the beehive. And so we're just looking into different ways that we can take a look at that as well. Uh, mycorrhizal networks are another interesting area and very popular in, uh, in I guess, uh, modern culture in terms of the media, et cetera. People are talking about these fungal networks that can act as transmission media to basically signal, uh, you could say, act as a signal transmission network between trees. That's the theory. We think that could be another interesting way to gather data. So we are looking into planting a sensor within mycorrhizal networks and to understand what those signals look like. About 40 different signals have been observed in nature that are almost like Morse code. And there's really no understanding of what those signals mean, but they are repeated and they are of the same structure repeatedly. And so there is a, a theory that this is one of the communications modalities that forests use to basically communicate about different conditions. It could be relegated to the mycorrhizal network itself. It could be a way that other plants transmit different uh, information back and forth to different ends of the forest. These kinds of patterns have been observed in nature in terms of an invasive species at one end of a forest going across the forest over time. And by the time it gets to the other end of the forest, the trees have developed defenses against that invasive species. There are a lot of theories about how they communicate, and this is one of them, so we plan to explore it. Mussels are also a natural filtration system <clears throat> found in the waterways of many human settlements. And currently, the, uh, the method to understand the pollutants in, that, that pass through these mussel farms is literally to pluck a mussel off the, the farm and, and uh, dissect the poor thing. And so the idea is now to place sensors, which has already been accomplished, by the way, to place sensors inside of these mussel farms to take a look at the different pollutants that are passing through these systems and get an idea of what the uh, human generated pollutants would be. And getting back to this again, I've already covered this in depth, but uh, the picture in the middle, that's uh, Leo Horty on the left, uh, who's our sensor designer, one of our sensor designers, and then uh, Ryan Coffey on the right, the gentleman at uh, Stanford, and they're discussing uh, the latest sensor design. And you'll see we've already done some, uh, some initial sensor surveys uh, the one in the middle, that picture is actually in downtown San Francisco. We also have another one in Half Moon Bay. And we've been in discussions with bee scientists in Finland and also in uh, Tanzania to basically implant sensors in those areas as well and then begin this network effect. Mycorrhizal networks, I did touch on that earlier. And muscle farms, I touched on that as well. And so I think what's interesting now is the actual architecture and the idea itself. So you see these sensor networks and what the idea is. And again, these networks include the satellite networks and the oceanic sensors and the atmospherics. And so the yellow circles represent the sensor networks themselves. And they filter back into kind of a edge network of AI applications that do the elemental anomaly detection. And then they transmit that data to the next level of AI analysis that goes into more of a regional survey of all the different sensors and what that could mean to the general health and, and well being of that particular region. But then it's further pushed up into a continental level AI instance that can then begin to assess what's taking place on a wider scale. And then that would then be push, pushed up into a global analysis, really creating a chain of AI analysis from the edge all the way to the core, which is very similar to many IT architectures in production today. But again, on a vastly different scale, this is really like a, uh, you could almost say like a large scale, a global CDN network or a global mobile network in effect. Um, I think that's kind of a loose description because it'll involve a lot of different transmission modalities. But I, I think what's neat about this is it really is something that can be achieved and can be achieved today. In terms of our architecture, um, this is a very rough kind of graph, I guess you could say, but it's just for the sake of explanation. Uh, many of the elements already exist in the field today, um, container infrastructures, data repository frameworks, uh, AI development platforms. 
we want people to be able to bring what they want, but there are some that are well proven in the field today. And if you go beyond that, what really is needed are things like AI model catalogs and self-identifying asset frameworks. And that's something that, uh, that Dinesh Verma and others in, in, in Josh and others in the community have been driving to basically provide something like that, where we can take assets and place them in a catalog, but also have metadata associated with those assets to provide historical and development context as well. And then there are the AI models themselves that we want to provide out, but the cross-correlation and federated AI aspects are in consideration and under discussion, and uh, Heiko Ludwig and, uh, and Natalie have been incredibly helpful in terms of driving that conversation on a bi-weekly basis and really helping us understand what those options could be in terms of federated architectures, and then eventually getting us to that state of cross-correlation where it needs to be. Then there are, of course, the usual accuracy, drift, and ethics parameters that need to be applied over time. And, and that's a very broad area. I can break that down at a later date. But then we get into an advisory interface, which could be quite fascinating. I mean, we could start with a real-time kind of dashboard and then get into things that are a little more kind of fun, esoteric over time. But something that really represents the totality of that information on a global scale and what that interpretive, I guess you could say, framework would be that would provide that data out is going to be its own area of study. So I think that's going to be interesting as that goes forward. Again, I've already talked about the AI, I guess, uh, waterfall effect, so to speak, with all the data and how it'll be basically analyzed. But I'd like to take us into the Tanzania irrigation AI use case. And this was brought to us by the UNF C and the CTCN project arm. And it was a proposal from Tanzania to build what is in essence a early warning system for irrigation management for the country of Tanzania. And the idea is really, if there are gonna be any flood or drought conditions coming up, how do you let the farmers and the cooperatives and the commercial farmers know about this in advance, or at least as far in advance as possible? Because Sub-Saharan Africa, with the advent of climate change, has been going through very extreme forms of droughts and floods, and they've been getting more pronounced as time has gone on. For example, Kenya last year had the worst drought in 40 years in you know, almost recorded history in terms of what they've observed. So what's interesting is um, they wanna get ahead of that and they wanna use technology to do that, but to be able to transmit that data to farmers in a really efficient way. So the proposal is, and what we came to them with, was using satellites both from a, I guess you could say a surface perspective to understand irrigation patterns at a surface level observed by satellites with a relatively fine degree of granularity, but also use satellites like the GRACE IO satellites that basically study gravimetrics as they circle the earth. And so it's two satellites with a laser beam separating them by about 135 odd miles. And it acts as almost a, uh, I think for want of a better expression, a tuning fork. And it can inform the system as to what kind of groundwater levels and any groundwater migration that may be taking place underneath the surface of the earth. And so you're really getting two different sets of information there that really are needed for, for accurate cross-correlation in terms of what's available. But then what do you do on a cloudy day? You won't be able to see the, the surface of the earth. And so we would be putting in ground-based sensors or rather water-based sensors that would be uh, using Doppler radar to understand the speed and intensity of river flows and waterway flows, but also the depth as well and then use that as a ground truth for cross-correlation for all this data. This would all be transmitted through 5G telecom networks, which are widely available, but then taken into a data center in Tanzania that would basically be the location for the cross-correlation of the, of the data, and then to generate SMS alerts in turn to the farmers and cooperatives around the country. And so in working with the government of Tanzania also, um, what's really fascinating is just last week, I was uh, in touch with Gerald and he put me in touch with the, uh, the, the bee scientists of Tanzania who are now interested in our sensor project. And so this is really kind of a, just a momentum and a, a synergy that's really taking place that I think we've just found a vacuum that needs to be filled. This is the one area of kind of ground truth data on the ground with these sensors that needs to be applied. And so in addition to the existing satellites and other areas, we're beginning to build a complete system that really makes sense. 
So one of the other vacuums that needed to be filled was in the area of innovation. And what we also noticed is that the venture community had not really embraced climate change. And I was speaking with a general partner at uh, one of the big VC firms in Silicon Valley about a year ago, and maybe a year and a half ago. And they conveyed to me that climate is an area that they're really reluctant to get involved in because they can't see a return on investment. Now the world can see a return on investment in terms of positive benefit, but they have a uh, obligation to their own investors, so to speak, and so are their own investment boards. And so it's interesting. We realize that we have to find a way to drive innovation. And what better way to do that than a very highly public grand challenge where you can gather all those different ideas, help develop them and help elevate them so they begin to get used in, uh, in production use cases by different governments around the world. So that was the idea here was to step in and try to assist in that regard. Uh, we came up with a bunch of different infrastructure awards that were donated by uh, by IBM, AWS, Cove, Red Hat, and Equinix. And uh, we also provided consulting assistance to the winners as well. And uh, the winners of this, Agrospace, are going to be used in the Tanzania project with the UNFCCC. Now, Aim for Climate is an initiative with the U.S. and UAE governments for resilient agriculture, but we're trying to cross pollinate these technologies across different organizations and different projects to really elevate them up and give them the support they need to succeed. So again, with the UNFCCC, we've got the Tanzania irrigation proposal. We have that underway along with now the, uh, the B sensors. Uh, we also have an innovation grand challenge with the UNFCCC that we're really excited about with the technical executive committee that will be announced at COP28. Uh, we've also been providing AI leadership, or rather AI support, to really help with consulting and different aspects that uh, whenever questions arise on the part of the TEC and the CTCN and AIM for Climate, they can feel free to reach out to us and we can give them technical guidance in terms of what is possible, basically. <clears throat> and then also, uh, I, I was delighted to be invited to the Africa Climate Week uh, by the United Nations and gave a uh, scene setting uh, talk in terms of AI and why it's so critical to, to addressing this challenge. And also the 27th meeting of the uh, Technical exec Technology Executive Committee uh, in Bonn uh, for the United Nations, the UNFCCC as well. And so there's been really ongoing dialogue, ongoing support and ongoing engagement from that perspective. And we've been really excited to see that take place. So that's really the summary of the enterprise neurosystem and where we're at today. And uh, just want to thank everybody for all their support. And it's been a really exciting uh, couple of years to see this go really from a, a band of volunteers into a, uh, <laughs> a, a working group of professionals executing projects on behalf of these nations. And so it's just been wonderful to see it all come together. And I really owe you all a great debt of thanks. So uh, I think that's it for my presentation and uh, glad to handle any questions. Uh, um, for the overview, uh, I think do you want to say a few words about what you see as the most important activities of the ENG going forward? I think the most important activities, well, that's uh, that's directed by the community. So it's kind of interesting. It's it's a very organic kind of approach. And I'm not trying to be, uh, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but rather I think things have actually sprang forward in a very interesting way from the community itself. I think in terms of the immediate needs, um, focusing on the Tanzania project, um, getting that over the finish line for the CTCN, uh, and then using that as a springboard to start replicating that in other countries. And there have been other countries expressing interest in doing this architecture as well. So I think that begins the network effect. But I think what's fascinating is to do it in Tanzania, which is really, if you look at the Olduvai Gorge, you know, it's like one of the cradles of human civilization. To get that started there is really kind of exciting. And if we can replicate that out over time, I think that could be a nice springboard to really start to build this architecture out. And to network the beehives together, like, again, the beehives are pure research in many respects, but also can capture valuable data as well. So to be able to enable that research and gather that data and then begin to apply cross correlation to that or rather uh, anomaly analysis, uh, that's another area of focus as well because those different systems in nature may have signals that we haven't actually actually captured yet in, in the depth that's required. It's a real vacuum in terms of the, and I keep using the word vacuum, but it's fascinating to see 
there have been individual academic efforts to understand what these species are experiencing and how they communicate, but there hasn't been a unified effort to really bring that back in, into full data analysis. And so I think that is going to be another area of focus for the community. So between the Tanzania project and the integration of all those different forms of data, plus the nature-based sensors and what those communication patterns are, those will be two key areas of focus I see. Thank you. Any other questions for Bill? Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, then no. <laughs> we can um, probably close the call early. Also, I'm just wondering if we don't have questions because people are muted themselves and forget to unmute them and ask them questions. <laughs> Okay, and it, well then, Bill, thank you for the overview, and we look forward to working with you in the enterprise system group. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all your help. Thank you.